from uh, India and a good morning to everyone joining us from the US. I see a lot of uh, uh, attendees joining us from the US, uh, Mr. Tom and several others. Um, I am Gauri Dwedi, visiting fellow at the USI. I welcome you all to this joint webinar by uh, USI and RAND Corporation. There's frankly a lot to talk as far as the South China Sea is concerned, the kind of dynamics that one is seeing, a fast evolving situation, developments coming in thick and fast. And what's most interesting is that while the issue is not new, what is new is the kind of confrontation that's happening between the US and China. And in fact, fresh as we speak, more developments coming in from Vietnam as well, which has essentially told China to sort of back off before talks can go any further. And uh, let me on that note also welcome and bring in, uh, first welcome His Excellency, High Commissioner of Vietnam, Mr. Chow, with us on uh, this very special uh, webinar. Also, we have uh, His Excellency, Ambassador of Philippines, uh, on the uh, on this webinar, uh, Philippines member is is a country that won that case against China, which of course uh, nobody paid heed to. Not, uh, Beijing did not pay any heed to it. It was 2016 when Philippines Manila won that case in the international tribunal. Beijing very conveniently said that the nine dash line predates any of the international laws. Um, in fact, Ambassador of Ethiopia, as well as uh, His Excellency Ambassador of uh, Mozambique would also be with us as well on the broadcast uh, on this webinar. Before I go any further, let me quickly welcome both uh, Major General B.K. Sharma, Director USI, and Dr. Rafiq Dosani, Director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy. For, and uh, let me bring them in for their quick uh, welcoming comments. And uh, let's get this uh, started. Uh, General Sharma, to you first, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ori. As firstly, I must compliment you for taking this initiative to get us USI and RAND on the same track. And we look uh, forward to many more such. Good evening to our co panelist, uh, that is Mr. Rafiq, who is director of Asia Pacific Center, and Mr. Mark Kozad, who is a known senior international defense researcher working with RAND and works on military assessments. Also, a very warm welcome from our side to Admiral Sina, who is a council member and he's been commander-in-chief. And special welcome to our former chief, General Ved Malik, uh, who's also been chairman of COSC, and also Admiral C. Lama, our council members. Uh, fraternity of Rand Corporation, excellencies from different embassies, ladies and gentlemen. We are extremely happy to do this event with the world's most reputed organization that is RAND, which is involved in interdisciplinary research and has made a niche for itself in terms of strategic forecasting and much of US policy is uh, predicated or de dependent on some of the studies which RAND does. As far as the US side is concerned, India's oldest think tank established in uh, 1870 by the Britishers uh, for undertaking most of their studies and uh, uh, campaign research when they were into an expeditionary mode to expand the British Empire beyond the boundaries of India. Uh, and present uh, Nearly 15,000 members. Uh, we are a typical tank, one point think tank. There's a lot of uh, uh, participation from the serving fraternity of diplomats and uh, senior officers from the three services. We have uh, nearly about four centers. We do a lot of research on military history and conflict studies. We also run distant learning programs for career progression of our courses. And USI is uh, probably Asia's oldest journal being published uh, since 1874. And uh, our typical think tank is Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation, which among other things does net assessment Scenario building and strategic making for National Defense College, uh, the war colleges, and also the policy makers at the very apex level. 
so there is a lot of commonality on the kind of work or the domain expertise that USI has and what Rand does. And we have a lot of scope probably to do many more projects in the future for our NetSF and, and scenario building and scenario gaming. Coming to the subject, I will not labor on this because we all know the strategic importance of uh, South China Sea. We also know that today this is world's most uh, touch point and uh, China's strategic future in the South China Sea is very well known. What are its implications? We know what actually is more intriguing. But what China talks about being a responsible stakeholder and talks about, you know, shared destiny of mankind and a harmonious world. But they picked up the most inopportune moment to exhibit their hegemonic designs and their appetite for territory and such like things. You know, mm -hmm. resorting to bullying behavior to smaller countries. I don't think uh, the world can afford to permit China uh, to take this route and bear with its strategic behavior. It is time that the rest of the world gets together and we do some kind of a, a collaboration which is not as much as to contain China but to definitely to balance China and moderate its strategic behavior so that it acts and behaves like a responsible uh, state within an international system. So that's the tone for today's debate. I, I won't talk much. And with this, I'll now request uh, uh, Mr. Rafiq Dosani to make his uh, introductory remarks. Over to Mr. Rafiq Dosani. Thank you, Jayakar. And uh, thank you also for inviting Rand to participate uh, with you in this event. We are very happy to do so. Um, so Rand is relatively young compared to USI. You've been around for 150 years, Rand for 72. Uh, so there's a lot to learn from each other, I'm sure. Um, both, of, both of us were formed for the purpose of scholarship, both for research and training. Currently, Rand has about 2,000 staff members, half of whom are PhD level researchers who work in a range of areas, including national security, the environment, education, healthcare, uh, economic development, and other areas. We are also active and well-known for our work in area studies, that is, geographic area studies, uh, including, of course, the Asia-Pacific. Every year, uh, as part of our mandate, every single RAND report is available free on the web. Every year, we add about 1,000 new reports. Uh, the mission of the center that I direct, the Center for Asia-Pacific Policy within RAND, is to build area studies in the Asia-Pacific. To that end, we have launched chairs in China, Korea, and Taiwan. We will be adding them in other countries in the years to come, I hope, into India in the near future. Uh, we have a visiting fellows program that enables scholars from the Asia Pacific to come and spend up to two years at RAND to engage in research projects with uh, RAND researchers and understand how RAND develops projects in the business. And finally, we have a board of uh, distinguished advisors. Some of them are on this call, including the ex foreign minister of Thailand, Honorable Kantati Supamongkwan, uh, Rob Ayler of Indies joined us from Taiwan and several others, Raju Reddy from Silicon Valley. Uh, so this topic is a very interesting one. It engages India's long-term choices and challenges on its way to becoming a great power in the way that the US already is and China is slowly climbing the ladder. India does not, it seems, mind being third in the ladder to follow China because it uh, means that there is a place for itself. But this requires China to keep moving up the ladder, being pushed down by the U.S. could disturb the player in the third place. The U.S.'s long arms might stretch around India to hold it while China tumbles, but that might require a level of strategic dependence that India does not want. Meanwhile, India's more difficult trade-offs between the economy and defense make the climbing far more arduous than for China than, and the U.S. All in all, this is a very interesting topic, and some would argue that it even raises existential concerns. 
down the road, uh, and I hope that we will get a chance to discuss all these topics we today. With that, let me add your thanks, General Sharma, to our speakers, uh, Dr. Sina and my colleague, Dr. Kozan, and to also thank uh, the Mukherjee Gauri Dwivedi for uh, organizing this excellent session. He's worked very hard, I know, to make this come together, and I wish you all success in moderating this session. Over to you, Dwivedi. Thanks for that, sir. Yes, uh, there is a lot that's happening as far as uh, the South China Sea is concerned. As both you as well as General Sharma pointed out, uh, the kind of strategic interests that are at play here and the fast-paced developments that are in fact taking place right now. And in that context, the, the Quad and in fact, as our uh, topic also suggests, either whether India is inching towards there's just so much of back and forth that has happened in the last couple of years and, and Vice Admiral Sinha will be touching upon whether or not India is now inching towards Quad. I just want to add two bits, which is that we are having this conversation a day before the second ministerial meeting of the quadrilateral security arrangement. There has been a sort of an acceptance amongst the four nations that they need to upgrade, but how much will they upgrade? whether it will be a military apparatus like the NATO, whether it's going to be a formalization of the agreement, and what happens to some of the other implications, as Dr. Dasani mentioned, which is trade, because trade really and the, and the economic uh, arrangements that these nations have with China is, is an open needs to be considered. Uh, and without much ado, let me now, in fact, bring in uh, Vice Admiral Sinha, who is a uh, Naval aviator in his four decades of service, he's held command of four warships, including a guided missile destroyer, two fighter squadrons, a naval air station, and the Western Naval Fleet. As Vice Admiral, he was responsible for operations, perspective plan, and defense acquisition. As Commander in Chief of the Western Naval Command, he was responsible for maritime security of India's Western Sea Board and has earned two gallantry awards and al alumnus of the Defense Services Staff College, the College of Naval Warfare and the National Defense College. He has an MPhil in Strategic and Security Studies. He's a trustee of the India Foundation and is on the Governing Council of USI. Vice Admiral Sina, to you, sir, there are questions that come as far as not just the South China Sea, but the larger Indo-Pacific region. India stakes there, our own strategic uh, calculations, and of course, uh, uh, whether or not Quad is now going to be upgraded or is it likely to meet a fate similar as the earlier arrangement? To you, sir. Uh, thank you, Gauri. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, and uh, the director of USI, uh, Dr. Rafiq uh, Dosani, the director of uh, RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy Studies, uh, for inviting me to speak uh, on this, uh, as everybody said, the most contemporary geopolitical issue uh, is in India edging towards the Quad or not an assessment. Uh, my own sense, is, uh, this is my very own sense, uh, that the post-COVID uh, international order would depend largely on the side that the elephant turns. Uh, has there been sufficient indication that this turn has already begun? Uh, we will examine that. Uh, but let us first uh, see as to why what is the environment that uh, we live in here in India? Uh, and uh, is, it, is it some roadblock which has compelled India now uh, to look at the Indo-Pacific and the Quad particularly? Uh, so let me offer some of my uh, thoughts uh, and put across the, uh, you know, which gives some of the answers, some of the answers of the subject that I have been asked to speak. Uh, you know, after making a number of attempts to expand its international, continental uh, sort of interest, India seems to have been restricted uh, only to two things, that is the holding operation on the borders, uh, and secondly, to prevent any further loss of territory. Uh, so, you know, it, it appears that there is, there is a bit of a roadblock. 
passes through Pakistan and China for trade and commerce, which uh, Mauri mentioned about, uh, seems to have, uh, you know, hit a wall. Uh, Chabahar project for connectivity with Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, has its own nuances. We saw that very recently um, that uh, China has become very active in that area and there is going to be large investment. Iran also threatened uh, that it will do the Chabahar project and the making of the road by itself, uh, but two, three days later it was amended. Uh, that leaves only Bangladesh and Myanmar uh, in, as far as the land connectivity is concerned. Uh, that gives a little bit of substance to India's active policy uh, and uh, some prospects of its land-based trade, uh, land route trade to, uh, with the Southeast Asia. Well, to cut the long story short, one can observe uh, that India's excessive focus on the continental canvas uh, since independence uh, while it has provided the, uh, you know, the uh, integrity of our uh, borders, uh, but uh, it hasn't yielded very great results uh, either uh, to have a very healthy relationship with our neighbors uh, or to act as a deterrence against any of the adversaries with, that we have. So this is the situation that uh, India finds itself after uh, 75 years of its independence. Uh, people say that, you know, there has been a peaceful rise of Chinese say it's a peaceful rise of China, but I have been calling it the painful rise of China as far as the world is concerned. It has created more pains uh, than peace. Uh, and its very assertive behavior in South China Sea uh, has alarmed all law-abiding countries in the world. Uh, it is a signal that China will continue to exert military power and economic coercion in the maritime space wherever its trade and commercial interests lie. Uh, economic and military rise of China has given it the capacity uh, to bully and uh, threaten countries in the vicinity, particularly the ones which does not, who do not have a sufficient military and economic power. Um, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, we saw a lot of it, but now they have been told to uh, slow down. But in the meanwhile, they have already crossed the red line with all the countries with whom China had good relations. And that is, uh, we see the, uh, you know, the uh, trade war. Well, trade is also, you know, warfare these days. So we can, we have to be very cautious of that uh, approach. Um, Actually speaking, the China's bullying has been met uh, with some punishment by India in Eastern Ladakh very recently, uh, still on, and in Doklam in Sikkim uh, somewhat some time back. Uh, but I you know it has it has really sent a uh, uh, bit of a lesson to the PLA. Uh, I think those are the pitfalls of uh, online uh, discussion platforms and forums. I think uh, Vice Admiral Sinha's uh, internet uh, may be playing truant. Gauri, maybe you can ask him to get in on the phone line. Yes. Give him a call on his mobile, or if you want me to do that, yes. I'll, I'll call him. I'll call him. Could 
Yeah, as, as he as General Sharma is suggesting, Gauri, you might want to get started with mock. Yeah. Should I? Uh, should we get in, uh, Doctor yeah, Pozar? Yeah, yeah, we can get him whenever he is online again. We can get him back. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I'll just quickly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mark Kozad. He is a senior international defense uh, researcher at RAND. He's led research of efforts on China and Russia, dealing with a diverse range of issues from military modernization, strategic operational planning, defense mobilization, strategic warning and deception. And prior to RAND, uh, he was a senior executive in the U U.S. intelligence community specializing in East Asia security issues. He served in a wide range of assignments, including as the deputy director of the president's daily brief staff and as the defense intelligence officer for East Asia. Dr. Kozat, to you, sir, that every day we hear a fresh statement from the U.S. Department of Defense, a fresh statement from Mike Pompeo uh, as to how bad the situation is. Uh, there's been a lot of escalation, but I want you to tell us sir, some of the concerns that uh, have been raised by security experts in terms of where the two, that is the U.S. and Chinese naval assessments and the larger military assess, uh, capabilities in the region stand out and uh, your perception of uh, how things could pan out in the event that there is actually an escalation of tensions from where we already are. Okay, well, good evening and thank you for inviting me to provide a few brief thoughts on uh, this increasingly contentious, complex and potentially dangerous issue. Um, recent military activities in the South China Sea involving both Chinese and U.S. forces have demonstrated that both sides remain resolute in defending their respective positions, China in defending its territorial claims that the international community views as having no basis, while the United States and its partners grow increasingly concerned about freedom of navigation and access to maritime resources in the midst of China's military modern militarization of its South China Sea outposts. As relations between the United States and China continued their downward trajectory, I will focus my comments on three key issues. The first concern is a negative trend in the regional military balance, particularly between the United States and China. Second, cooperation between allies and partners is more important than ever in addressing China's aggressive expansion in the South China Sea. Accordingly, we need to address the Quad's role in military preparedness in addressing these strategic trends. Lastly, we need to consider the, the United States' willingness to uh, protect the EEZs of countries in the region, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. Um, to start off with the, China, with the military balance, um, it has been trending negatively for several years as the United States has remained focused on its two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Tight defense budgets constrain the range of programs the United States senior leaders could pursue and both wars complexity dominated their attention. China's military buildup, on the other hand, has continued to pay as Chinese leaders have maintained a consistent, focused determination in modernizing all elements of the PLA to compete and ultimately defeat the United States militarily if needed. The United States largely focused on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, while China has pursued a comprehensive modernization to its naval, air, air defense, and missile forces. Indeed, as this year's Department of Defense China Military Power Report highlights, the People's Liberation Army Navy, or PLAN, has surpassed the United States Navy in number of total ships. Likewise, China continues to deploy a large number of increasingly lethal anti-ship and air launch cruise missiles, while simultaneously extending the reach and capability of its medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles, which were on display earlier this summer in an exercise uh, focused on the South China Sea. China's air forces, including bombers, fighters, and air defense systems, are also now more modern, capable, and numerous than at any time in the past. And these improvements are all underpinned by an expansive modernization of China's space assets, its multi-layered intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance architecture, and an integrated command system for command and control. The United States' once significant advantage in overall numbers and technological capacity is now in question. The negative elements we see in this trend are compounded when considered in light of geographic disposition. China has built up and militarized its presence in the South China Sea, not only by an enhanced force posture in the Southern theater, 
but also in its construction of outposts on multiple reefs. The construction has included multiple facilities capable of housing deployed fighter aircraft, as well as regular basing of anti-ship cruise missiles, radars, surveillance equipment, and air defense systems. The numbers comparison between the United States and Chinese militaries is troubling. But when considered in the context of China's enhanced disposition and its persistent presence in the South China Sea and the United States' vast global commitments, U.S. policymakers and planners are faced with a highly contentious situation in which China, in many respects, has built a very favorable position. The military picture is certainly not welcome or encouraging, but China's most significant advantage is its lack of allies or partners acting toward a common purpose. The Quad has been a significant interaction among like-minded democratic partners in the region. While we need to be careful about overstating its impact, China has noted with concern despite its dismissive comments that common cause among Japan, Australia, India, and the United States has the capacity to become a powerful collaborative tool, particularly due to each nation's increasingly pessimistic view of China's behavior in the region. While the Quad brings together four nations with advanced, well-trained militaries who are reinforcing already strong military-to-military -military relationships, the Quad's political cloud is even more important. From a military standpoint, Indian, Japanese, and Australian militaries obviously bring complementary and highly capable forces to the U.S. force posture in the region, along with the U.S. force posture in the region. However, in contesting Chinese claims, the political dimension of the relationship provides meaning to military actions. Activities including freedom of navigation operations or FONOPS or in multinational exercises are a signal of common cause and resolve that demonstrate a commitment to ensuring free and open access to the region. Clearly, periodic exercises in FONOPS are not going to reverse China's position on its claims in the South China Sea, nor will they present a persistent challenge to China's military posture. However, they signal that the international community does not recognize China's claims to expanded sovereignty that if China attempts to enforce its so-called authority in these areas, it may have to entertain the possibility of confronting multiple actors. From this standpoint, the Quad's engagement is an indicator of an important shift in the region's perception of China, and particularly how it pursues its territorial and maritime claims. A little over a decade ago, members of the Quad faced hard questions about the extent to which they were willing to highlight China's aggressive behavior. Other nations in the region, region face similarly uncomfortable positions. In most cases, many countries in the region were faced with the stark reality of living in close proximity to China and also growing economic ties and dependencies. If members of the Quad had difficulty acknowledging China's aims, other nations acting independently would have similar problems. In this sense, the Quad's collective voice, along with its collaborative operations, highly capable militaries that frequently include multiple partners, provide an important political signal to China and the region that expansive territorial and maritime claims are outside of international law. The last issue that I would like to address is the U.S. United States uh, ability and willingness to protect the, the EEZs and territorial waters of regional nations such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Clearly, a United States response would be dictated by the specific circumstances at play but from an overarching perspective, the dynamics driving U.S. actions in the South China Sea are part of a much broader willingness to confront China on a range of issues and a dramatic downward spiral in the U.S.-China relationship. Secretary Pompeo's very direct statement about the United States' position on South China Sea claims, subsequent exercise activity and directed sanctions against individuals and companies involved in building China's outposts appear to be the beginning of an increased willingness on the United States' part to directly confront China on these issues. Equally important is the fact that across the American political spectrum, there appears to be a wide willingness to confront China on a host of issues that threaten to undermine regional stability and international norms. While specific U.S. policies and actions may change as a result of next month's election, many observers in the United States do not anticipate a wholesale reversal of this trend. Ultimately, perception of China as an aggressive strategic competitor with expanding aims and a desire to challenge existing international order is now broadly expect, accepted across the American political spectrum. While the United States position on the South China Sea has been made clear, many questions remain regarding how willing others in the region are to challenge China's claims. The United States, Japan, India, and Australia have conducted exercises with regional partners as a sign of shared commitment. 
Similarly, the United States has performed port calls and presence operations during periods of heightened tensions in an attempt to reassure those faced with Chinese incursions. However, there remains reluctance in the realm of coordinated action. Ultimately, the United States' willingness to protect regional countries should be considered from two perspectives. The first perspective is centered on those competing claimants who have to deal with Chinese coercion and aggression while simultaneously needing to maintain economic relationships. Those country, these countries have had concerns about the United States' long-term commitment to the region and a fear that if they push too far against China while relying on an uncertain partner, that they might face repercussions and the United States would not be there to support them. Similarly, there are concerns in the United States about shifting regional political dynamics and an unwillingness on the part of many regional nations to build closer security relationships. Most notably, recent U.S.-Philippine relations have highlighted this dynamic amongst two long-term allies. It is imperative that both sides of this dynamic, those who seek to challenge China's aggressive action and those who are reluctant due to proximity to China, begin to build a trust and a common approach to addressing these challenges or the problem will only get worse. I'll conclude with one thought. All sides in this discussion should be not thought of as having fixed objectives and interests. As we have seen over the past 15 years, Many countries' assessments of China's ambitions have evolved and come to realize that accommodation is unlikely to lead to positive outcomes. At best, it may only push negative outcomes to a later date. In my former experience, it was difficult to get many of my regional counterparts to discuss China as a political and military problem. However, most have come to realize that as China's comprehensive power has grown, so has its ambitions and its willingness to use coercion as a tool to achieve its objectives. Likewise, nations in the region now understand that non-confrontational strategies are unlikely to prevent China from making and pursuing expansive claims at others' expense. Hopefully, the Quad can serve as a catalyst that will help focus regional efforts to confront this challenging problem. And uh, with that, thank you for bearing uh, with me through, my, so through some prepared statements. I have a tendency um, to get a little excited and run long on my comments, so I wanted to keep them within time bounds. Uh, but this will conclude my uh, opening comments. Thank you, Dr. Kozad. Uh, Admiral Sina is back with us. Uh, sir, several questions around the Quad continue to uh, uh, remain. Skeptics continue to ask. Uh, and, and you were explaining, sir, your assessment of the arrangement and also the larger uh, region. Uh, hopefully it is so. Uh, what I was talking about, I'll start from where I left. Uh, mm -hmm. The foreign minister's meeting tomorrow in Tokyo, this is just the right time to define the idea of uh, war in the larger Indo-Pacific by... ...be very... ...that all for the same pace. Um, and that will be a big challenge, particularly for India, because of the, uh, you know, the economic... If if it uh, if it time have a secretariat and have uh, the right direction and possibly become quad plus in the near future, uh, you know there are countries with uh, interest in the in the uh, Indo Pacific uh, and therefore their presence here uh, is likely to be uh, one big possibility. Uh, it will be a warning to China uh, that its assertiveness uh, assertiveness. Uh, will not be allowed to hinder the peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific littorals. Um, the Quad or Quad Plus, uh, I, I feel that it has the capacity and capability uh, to prevent China uh, from its assertion in this entire area. Um, I have purposely left the issue of alliance since the uh, it generates a thought of uh, uh, you know curtailment of some of the decision-making ability of the partner state. Uh, and it uh, prohibits the uh, amount of freedom of operation. Uh, last, uh, before I conclude, I would just like to uh, mention that there is a general impression uh, that exercise Malabar uh, when Australia is invited, and I'm uh, I'm uh, reasonably certain that it will be, uh, is a quad platform. Uh, 
is a little, you know, is a different one. It is right now only dealing with the uh, economy, the trade research, and, and uh, you know, it's like what we do for vaccine for the COVID. Uh, but, uh, you know, the number of the uh, bilateral exercises which India is doing, India and Japan, uh, that makes people think in that direction. It could be. Uh, because India and uh, U.S. started Malabar in 1993. So they have reached very high levels of complexity, uh, complexities and interoperability. Uh, uh, and we have former chief of naval staff sitting here. I'm sure he will be able to uh, make some comment on that. Uh, but the presently, it is there are two different things. Um, and the exercises that are happening basically to get these two countries also at a level that when all four are operating together, they are on the same page. Uh, so that is what the uh, that is what the intention is. Uh, but a task force can be assembled in a in a very short period. Those who are participating in Malabar and there is a necessity uh, for the Quad to ensure that sea lanes of communication are uh, secured. Uh, you know, the task force can be assembled out of these four countries and charge can be given to any of the four countries depending upon which region the trouble has started and where it is likely to be uh, more effective. Uh, so therefore, I think that you know the, the, the Quad has a capability of uh, uh, using the Malabar Forum uh, for the security as and when it becomes uh, very clear by the tomorrow by tomorrow's meeting. Uh, the maritime security as an agenda of uh, Quad uh, can be met by Malabar, as I said. We hope to see that happen in very near future. And tomorrow, and probably we will get to know what are the what are the charters and are we going to have a, a headquarter of Quad uh, and how it is going to progress further. Right now, it is a lot of things are there. Uh, there are uh, you know arrangements. There are MOUs, uh, but there is no uh, firm. Uh, you know, location from where the quad headquarters is going to operate and what will be its charter. So I will leave it at that and some of it can be uh, answered in the QA. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, we also have uh, former uh, uh, Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral uh, Sunil Lamba, also with us. Uh, before before I open this up for Q and A, and in fact several questions have already come. I want to uh, bring in uh, His Excellency High Commissioner of Vietnam into this uh, discussion, and I want to understand from him uh, and his uh, you know quick remarks on uh, how the dispute is witnessing escalation of tensions. It's important to get uh, uh, your voice, sir, and your views simply because in the last 48 hours, there's been a lot of uh, updates coming in about how Vietnam is now pretty much telling China to sort of back off, that talks will happen, not when you continue to try and intimidate your smaller neighbors. Uh, your remarks, sir. Excellency, unmute yourself, yeah. Well, let me begin by expressing my sincere thanks to UIS, uh, Dr. Sharma, and Rand, uh, Mr. Rajiv Donasi, and Ms. Gori Divali for this very interesting webinar. I believe that the content of uh, this webinar is very relevant, especially from Vietnam's perspective. Before I share with you some of my observations on the situation in South China Sea, as well as the implications um, posed by the Chinese um, behavior, I would like to stress that Vietnam and China, we also are strategic partners. South China Sea is not the issue of our bilateral relations. Nevertheless, it is a pending issue that the two countries have to address. But South China Sea has more dimensions than the bilateral relations between China and Vietnam. Between Vietnam and China, we have the issues of spotlight, which China occupied from Vietnam in 1954 and in 1974. But in addition to the bilateral 
uh, sovereignty claim between the two countries. I believe that South China Sea has more than that. It has many things to do with peace and security in the region. It has many things to do with the freedom of navigation. It has many things to do with trust between major, uh, between the major countries and the smaller countries. So I would like to share with you first four points about how I see the situation in South China Sea. Number one, I agree with all the speakers who spoke before me that at the moment, and it is obvious that China pursue an expansive claim manifest in the nine dash slide and for Shah doctrine. And that claim has a cover 80% of South China Sea, and it is going against the letters and the spirit of UNCLOS 1982. So as put it by many countries in their respective not verbal, look at uh, the United Nations, all these claims by China are unlawful. So this is my first observation. My second observation is that China has used assertive and coercive measures, especially gray zone operations, in order to subdue other countries. So China has sent navies to intimidate many countries, and you can observe that, especially in this year 2020, when all countries are focusing on their efforts to fight against the COVID pandemic. China uh, uh, sent a, a fishing ship in v of Vietnam. China sent its vessels to uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and also the Philippines. And China used Coast Guard and Maritime Militia to clash directly with other countries' vessels. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kosat has mentioned about militarization of uh, artificial islands uh, and uh, and things like that. But what I want to stress here is that in order to actualize their claim, China decided to use force. So this is uh, this is no longer diplomacy. Uh, this is a gunboat uh, methods. So it is very dangerous when a major power use the force against smaller neighbors in the region. The third point is that when on the uh, on the legal front, China claim a lot and ignore unclose. On the ground, China use force. On the tactic front, tactical front, China try to use a rule, I mean, that's uh, divide and rule. And that technique applied within ASEAN countries. China try to break the, the solidarity within ASEAN and uh, prevent it from forging a strong position, an enormous position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China claim in South China Sea. So this is also an issue which need to be taken into consideration. The fourth point, I believe that China does not want other major powers or non-coastal uh, uh, countries, especially major power countries, to get involved in, the, in, the, in South China Sea. So China tried to ex exclude all the major powers one of the reflections of that attitude is in the negotiation of the code of conduct, which is underway. And uh, China come up with the positions that this is the matter that need to be addressed among coastal countries in the region. And non-regional countries should get away from this. That is the, my fourth point. My fifth point is that at the same time, China has been conducting a uh, propaganda um, war, uh, saying that um, uh, big countries of major power should behave like a major power. But indeed, China, uh, the, uh, the uh, words don't match with their deeds on uh, reality. So China used all these words in order to um, accuse the uh, phone up operation by USA. 
So by and large, those are the four, five observations that we see from reality, and I think that you are all agree with that. Now, from that five um, behavior, what are the implications? I believe that there are four implications that come from that five-point um, behavior by Chinese side. The first one is that safety and security in South China Sea is threatened. It is no longer safe and secure as China normally proclaimed. So, uh, especially now during the COVID-19, you see that uh, many, many dangerous maneuvering and gunboat diplomacy tensions in this water are underway. A lot of fishing uh, vessels are chased, especially the one from Vietnam and from the Philippines, and life of fishermen are threatened, and the especially the normal uh, oil and gas exploration operations are threatened, including the operations of oil and gas between Vietnam and India, which dated back 40 years ago, since 1986, and uh, which brings a lot of benefits, uh, which bring benefits to both India and Vietnam. And China also try uh, to obstruct the normal exploration operations of that project, which is located within the EZ of Vietnam, especially on the blocks 006.1. And uh, therefore, safety and security is, is, is threatened. Number two, law and order in South China Sea in particular, in Indo-Pacific in general, and in ocean in general has been endangered. And UNCLOS, which is normally termed as the universal constitution for the ocean, has been challenged. Uh, China also say that UNCLOS is not the only uh, document or uh, legal basis in order to address all the issues pertaining to South China Sea. But uh, that's why recently in the final statement of the chair of ASEAN, there is a very clear and for the first time indication and reflection of that principle. That principle go as unclosed as the only legal basis for the settling of all the disputes in the sea. So that one is not in conformity with the, uh, with the design of, of China. Therefore, I believe that as a consequence of the behavior of China, law and order are not observed. And not only law and order in the South China Sea, but also we see the, <coughs> the same pattern of law and order that may be violated in other parts of, of the world. I mean, you can refer to what is going on now between China and, and India. And my third point, my, my third implication, which is very important, is that the trust among nations has been eroding significantly. Now we call for oh, not only for peace and security to be strengthened and observed, but we also call for trust among nations to be respected. But with that uh, behavior, I think that uh, the trust is eroding. And uh, we have repeatedly called China to, um, to observe uh, international law and to refrain from doing anything that may complicate the current uh, already uh, complex situation in South China Sea in order to create a favorable condition for the negotiation and, and signing of the COC. But, uh, on various occasions, like recently, China exercise uh, military uh, conducted has conducted military exercises in the Spratly Islands um, or territory of Vietnam, for instance. And uh, number five, I believe that uh, the hegemonic attempt and behavior of China has um, resulted to bring in um, other countries like USA and uh, the uh, formulations of what, as you are discussing at the moment. 
I think that uh, uh, Vietnam has many other countries in the regions. We don't want to get stuck in the uh, rivalry uh, between major powers. But as we put it very clearly in the recent AMF ASEAN ministerial meeting, that we welcome all uh, all countries, um, non uh, regional, non regional, to make contribution to preserving peace and security in the regions. Now, my last point is that the South China Sea now is no longer a storm in the teacup. It Excellency, I hate to interrupt you, sir, but in the spirit of the time frame, sir, we are, I, I want to quickly take in some comments and some questions that the panel has asked. Would that be okay with you, sir? Or, or uh, yes, I, because I, I there are lots of by, questions coming in, sir. Yeah, I finished by saying that I think that um, India should take note of the recent development and joined other countries to express its clear objections to the unlawful claims and actions. Those countries uh, like uh, the the, e, the three European countries and uh, uh, in an attempt to uh, to fight against the change of status quo. So this is my recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency. Thank you so much for those uh for that brief overview and also more importantly, what lies ahead. Uh, I want to quickly take in some questions that have come in. Uh, one, of course, is around the Quad arrangement. Uh, His is, is Excellency, uh, you know, I may have some questions, but I'm going to come back to you on that, sir, because, you know, Vietnam and Philippines are one of the key nations that are uh, really in the thick of things and which is why we also have uh, the Philippines ambassador, sir. I'll, I'll take your comments in just a bit. But first, on, on the Quad arrangement, there are two specific questions that have come in. One is that if there is not a clear signal that is sent out by the arrangement in case of a military intervention by China, then does that compromises the very premise of having the Quad? Admiral Sina, you want to take this? Because I, there's another question that Dr. Kozad can take after this. Yeah, I, I think that uh, tomorrow's meeting is very significant because the security has to be added to the uh, agreed charter of Quad right now. Uh, in that case, the Malawar will, will become the uh, backbone of the security architecture. I have no doubts about this. Uh, but whether it will happen in tomorrow's meeting or not, that we will we have to see very uh, no, wait and see. But surely it will it will address maritime security in some form or the other. It may or may not uh, may not mention that uh, you know the uh, Malabar will become the security architecture. But it will say that the action whatever whatever action is required. That's my thought right now because this is a foreign ministers meeting and they will probably uh, keep it more to uh, you know diplomatic nicety and mention very broad about maritime security. But it is right that if you don't have anything mentioned in this, uh, then it might just encourage China to continue misbehaving. There's a question on uh, the economic corridor in Myanmar. I'm going to first finish the loop as far as Quad is concerned. What about Quad Plus? Dr. Kozak, there's been so much of of talk about, you know, it's important to enhance the quadrilateral security arrangement, include some of the other countries which are effective affected parties. And Vietnam is one such uh, country that, of course, has been named. We have the High Commissioner also with us. Do you think the time for Quad to be relevant is when Quad Plus comes into existence? I think, I think the quad is going to be relevant even without that. And I think um, Admiral Sena's statement about the, the security aspect um, needing to be addressed at some point is a really important one because to date we've seen a series of largely disconnected types of military operations that involve quad members, but they have not been done in the name of the quad and with any with any sense of direction. So, you know, the, the, the common cause, the action there, I think is very important. But I also think that it can be it can be more important if structured through that that common perspective that the quad can provide. In terms of um, quad plus, um, again, members of the quad exercise and train regularly and have military to military release relationships that are already very deep with, in many cases, with non-members with with, with non-members. Um, so I think that it's very important 
uh, for those efforts to continue, but I think that they would only be enhanced um, with added um, benefit in the quad. The one thing that you wanna prevent um, with any type of organization, particularly one that's addressing security concerns and the types of challenges that China presents in the South China Sea, is you want to make sure that there's a common understanding of what the objectives are, and you want to make sure that everyone involved um, is willing to participate in those and, and, and able to participate in those. So I think expansion is a good idea, but you also need to be very careful of the possibility that with added members, the quad may lose or may become captive to um, to uh, consensus thinking, which can take a lot, a lot, a lot of additional time in responding to particular crises. Dr. Kozai, what about economic cooperation? You know, because many feel that unless and until you include the trade dynamics, uh, Quad is still incomplete. I mean, an example of that could be Australia. The moment it talked about an independent inquiry into COVID, the first thing that Beijing did was it delayed the Australian exports and it had a huge impact. So essentially, I'm saying that trade in 21st century dynamics has to be the backbone, or do you think has to be the backbone of any arrangement? Um, I would agree with that. It has to be the backbone. Um, it is the backbone. Um, but then again, countries are going to have to start rethinking that relationship and reconsidering that relationship, because if everything boils down to trade, um, a very large number of countries are going to be beholden to China and um, that's a huge element for coercion. I think countries need to look at how to diversify um, their trade relationships uh, to the largest extent possible. Otherwise, that reliance is going to create significant vulnerabilities. Um, and again, it becomes very important for nations um, to think about what their priorities are and, and how those are um, articulated. Um, because if they don't go beyond the trade relationship, then again, China is going to have um, a lot of leverage in being able to pursue these expansionist objectives. Gauri, you have to unmute yourself. Apologies, sir. I think there's a question on the economic corridor in Myanmar. How big a strategic challenge it will be for uh, uh, the Quad, given that it's impacting Bay of Bengal very significantly, Vice Admiral Sina. Well, uh, you know, Bay of Bengal has to come into focus, uh, you know, sooner than later uh, because of the uh, the Chinese have already made a uh, very loud into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, what, what right now what is happening is uh, that China is under impression uh, that by cutting through uh, the cutting through the Myanmar route, uh, it is going to be little okay with him because he's not going through Malacca Straits. Uh, little realizing that Bay of Bengal is our uh, uh, very strong area where the Indian Navy by itself has got uh, a sufficient military power, sufficient uh, naval combat power, and it also brings many other uh, uh, countries' interest. But as far as I can see, in the strategic challenge will be to getting the other littorals to act against the Chinese coercion. That is a more difficult part because if you see the you know interaction of let us say Sri Lanka or let us say uh, to some extent Bangladesh and Myanmar. Uh, these countries will be very hard pressed to openly say anything or forum which is seen or it is believed to be stopping china from doing what it is doing so therefore initially i mentioned that i see it as a total of a three very distinct area in the indo-pacific and the quad countries will have to uh, come together collectively to prevent the chinese from you know being uh, being sort of uh, bully or taking any military action, but the Chinese trade and commerce will remain equally vulnerable, Gauri, as far as Bay of Bengal is concerned. In fact, it might become more vulnerable by by nature. You know, it is called Bay of Bengal. It is not called a sea. So it is a bay. If you see the map, it is actually inside a small triangle. Uh, and, and that makes the life of uh, any any country which doesn't belong, who's not a resident country of Indian Ocean region, 
it is that much more difficult. In fact, it is a bigger challenge to China than it is to the Quad countries. Dr. Kozan, you want to add to it? No, I think that actually sums it up uh, very nicely. I think there are a lot of questions related to economic and trade sanctions because, as I said, and as, as Dr. Kozar also said, that the Chinese arrangement to a large extent has been through trade and through the kind of economic heft it carries. Uh, Dr. Dosani, you want to come in there that anything now to counter contain Beijing cannot be seen only through the prism of military capabilities. It has to be seen through the prism of countering a $13 trillion economy. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, it is economic power that ultimately will drive uh, uh, India's ability to respond. Uh, you know, we did a study, of, a small study of Taiwan recently looking at how it could decouple from China as it's been trying to do since President Tsai took over four years ago. And we found that it's actually going to be very difficult. Just one country, Taiwan, employs 10 million um, people to work for its uh, exports uh, in China. Now, to replace 10 million uh, workers in China, uh, we looked at other countries in the region, including India, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, um, and Indonesia, and we found that you can't get those 10 million. Uh, so, you know, the ability to replace China in the medium term is, is really zero. And therefore, to think even of strategies which would say that you know, we can combine together our heft to replace China's uh, economic power, which really derives from its ability to make on in scale high quality goods uh, and services, but more goods, so it is actually going to be a big challenge. Thank you. In fact, uh, Professor Moomin Chen, who is the Deputy Representative of Taiwan to India, is also with us in this discussion. And there's been so much of talk uh, about Taipei, its significance, its relevance, as far as the overall South China Sea is concerned. Given that there are no questions right now, I take the liberty of being the moderator to ask the next question. And, and this is something I throw up to both the panelists, both uh, Vice Admiral Sina and Dr. Kozad, which is that how significant is Taiwan? And how significant is this assessment that for Washington, the real deterrence is that Manila, Tokyo, in fact, even Taipei, some of the others need to be aware that and need to be assured that if there is escalation, Washington will come in. I think that itself is a deterrence enough. Is that still there or has those dynamics changed a little? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Quickly, uh, Professor Chen, let me let me just get in some of the other the, the answers and then I'll get you in, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can, can I speak now? Sorry, you're on mute. No. Let's get in Dr. Kozad first, and Professor Chen, I'll get you in then. Yeah. Um, I think to a large extent, those uh, perceptions in China still exist. Um, that is one question I spend a lot of time actually looking at. Um, and that is something that is built up over a period of time is that the United States feels that there is a United States commitment um, to defend these interests um, and these partners and allies in the region. Um, and that is not something that has changed over the past 20 years. In fact, in some cases, it's probably uh, grown because China sees the United States as a defining power very jealously guarding um, very, very jealously guarding these uh, alliances and relationships. Um, I also think there's another element to it as well, though, is that the uh, Chinese are seeing some very negative trends. And when you talk about Japan and Taiwan, um, those trends are things that have worked counter to a lot of Chinese efforts over the past couple of decades. If you look at Japan, um, public opinion in Japan and defense uh, developments in Japan uh, suggests that there is a growing uh, recognition in that country 
that the Chinese um, the Chinese militarization presents a significant threat. And because of that, uh, they have been pursuing a lot of things that 20 years ago we never really, um, re really never imagined. Um, in terms of Taiwan, um, and I'm sure that uh, the ambassador can speak to this much better than I can. Um, there's a, a changing political dynamic on the island that I think worries the Chinese significantly. And in part, uh, that has to do with uh, changes in, in the way that um, Taiwan citizens think of themselves and their relationship uh, with China. And the, the development of the situation in Hong Kong has had a very negative impact on those perspectives. Um, and also uh, the, the perceptions in Taiwan that that very close relationship with China, while economically important, also presents some potential challenges. Um, and they understand uh, the level of, of um, potential coercion uh, that exists if you let that economic relationship uh, continue to develop in the way that it was. Um, so I think from both of those standpoints, there are some very negative trends from Beijing's perspective. Uh, Professor Chen, you want to uh, have you have a question or you want to make a quick comment, sir? Because there are two questions that have come in for Vice Admiral Sina also. Yeah. Yes, I would just a uh, very quick uh, comments on uh, Taiwan issue. Uh, basically, uh, yes, uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, economic is uh, highly uh, dependent on China in the past uh, few years. Uh, and uh, about 40 percent of uh, Taiwan's uh, export goes to China. But uh, in uh, because of this uh, 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 a confrontation between uh, Taiwan and China is increasing, and we feel uh, more hostility from China. So actually, the investment uh, to China has uh, significantly reduced in the past two three years. And uh, right now, I think in Taiwan, the situation is uh, uh, that most of people are now <clears throat> have a very strong uh, sense of uh, being a Taiwanese, and we also feel that we have been isolated by the international community. We want to participate in. Uh, uh, security related dialogue such as Quad. So we hope there will be any opportunity. And uh, 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 we know that the, uh, the, the political situation, the political relation between Taiwan and China cannot be solved easy. But uh, Taiwan is uh, a sovereign, independent country, and we hope to uh, have a more friends around the world. This is my brief uh, comment on this issue. Thank you, Thank you Professor Chen. Uh, Admiral Sina, for long, uh, India has been considered to be probably the weakest link as far as the Quad is concerned. Uh, the questions that have come in is also regarding, does India continue to be one of the impediments to take Quad to the next level? And also regarding the trust deficit, particularly between India and Australia? I think the situation has uh, been changing for the last uh, three, four years. So you know, the trust deficit with Australia. Uh, I, I personally, I don't agree with this because uh, I, I remember one of the uh, seminars that, uh, um, and one of the uh, gentlemen from the Australian uh, Defense University, uh, he asked me the question that, uh, why is India so reluctant to admit, uh, you know, Australia into the world? So I mentioned to him that he was from the Foreign Service and I mentioned to him that actually you should be giving this answer. Uh, you, you know, when Kevin Rudd was the Prime Minister, you know, very reluctant to uh, do anything which will annoy China. Because all said and done, uh, Australia has a trade surplus of nearly 29% against uh, with China. Uh, and therefore, uh, it was not uh, not a doubt in uh, anybody's mind that Australia will find it very difficult, which Mark also just now mentioned about, uh, like Taiwan, very difficult to uh, you know uh, pull out completely from uh, you know the business from uh, China. But uh, you may recall the last meeting of the officials of the Quad, which took place. Uh, one thing that has come right on the paper now that as far as the supply chain is concerned. Uh, these four countries who are partners in the Quad, uh, they will look at each other's interest first and shift the supply chain arrangements into one of these countries. So that is one, Australia, Japan, U US and India. Second part is that, you know, the president, the president Tsai, from the time she has come, she has realized the threat of this uh, uh, the economic intertwining of Taiwan with uh, the PRC. Uh, and therefore, she has, uh, you know, started that new southbound policy in which Taiwan is very, very aggressively pushing it. It's not that uh, you see the 
the Apple phones, which are now being manufactured here in India uh, by the Taiwanese company, Fox has already invested one one billion dollar, and the target set by the uh, between the two trade offices is going to twenty billion dollars by twenty twenty two. Uh, we have, they have already we have already crossed about seven and a half billion dollars uh, is to uh, trading partners if you don't want to call it a trading nation uh, but there is lot happening uh, behind the scene which does not come into public domain very much uh, because right now everybody is looking at you know the pudding and not how it is being prepared they all want to eat the pudding but it takes a little bit of time economic trade commercial issues. Uh, the diplomatic relations of uh, Taiwan, the status of Taiwan in the, uh, you know, in the United Nations, all that is also a you know, issue where you know people are working. Uh, but uh, India has not been the weakest. Actually, India started the, uh, you know, the discussion in 2007 when uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe came and spoke in the Parliament. He talked about this for the first time confluence of democracy. After that, these two prime ministers have been very active. So I I think it's a little bit of wrong perception. But yes, how much commitment a country will have to oppose or to resist China has been a major issue in which India has taken its time to get convinced. And right now it is the right time. And we have got a bilateral with Australia now, which is opens all the doors. General Sharma, there's an, General Sharma, there's an interesting question that's come about why is India not exporting lethal military hardware to countries like Vietnam, who've been asking for Brahmos for, for a decade now? Now, a couple of times that I have had very detailed discussions. Vietnam today uh, has no sensitivities towards China and whatever help we have asked of India that has been rendered. Uh, well, to talk about Brahmos and Akash and other things, a lot of this fight flying takes place. What Vietnam is basically interested is that India should diplomatically support their stand as far as South China Sea is concerned. And they should help them in indigenization of their own defense industry, in cyberspace, and uh, in uh, in building up their own defense ind industrial complexes. And India is doing a great deal. We've already got a wide shipping uh, kind of an agreement with them, and they also talk about having maybe upgrading this to a gray shipping kind of a level. I think we enjoy excellent <coughs> relationship and whatever. Uh, Vietnam has demanded of India that in render and if they have some more requirement, I'm sure that uh, those will also be met by India. Uh, to just add one more point here, you know, this uh, talk about India being reluctant partner in uh, Quad, it also needs to be seen in its correct perspective. We have nearly a 4,000 kilometer long border with China. They are our next door neighbor. And right, we have a live problem with China here. Therefore, if you look at the other countries, uh, United States has a uh, you know, alliance, a security alliance, both with Australia and with Japan, right? And they virtually part of an alliance system, a security alliance system, whereas India is not. Therefore, if India joins the bad wagon, certain security guarantees have to be given to India. Some pressure builds up on our continental border, then some actions will have to be taken by the court countries to relieve pressure uh, as far as maritime space is concerned. So I think we should not be very ambitious. Let's see what happens of this meeting, which is now coming up, and the security architecture in place. And I'm sure the passage of time this idea will gain traction and probably more and more countries like France, France, Germany, they will also join, uh, come on board and we'll have a concept of expanded uh, quad in Thank you. 
Okay, I, I'll, I'll take one last question for Dr. Kozad and then I'm going to end this with uh, uh, the ambassador, uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Bhagat Singh Jr. Yes, uh, but you know, Dr. Kozad, this is a question, in fact, uh, something that I also wanted to ask that's come in about the fact that when you talk about Chinese military capabilities in the South China Sea, when you talk about them having uh, anti-access, anti-denial uh, uh, technology there, the fact that the United States may not have invested enough, that's a question that's come in from, uh, uh, from the audience, in fact, saying that the U.S. forces are too far away to have any material impact on a short-term attack by China along with the knowledge of the U.S. loss in war games involving China, the South China Sea, and the conflict in the Taiwan Strait. Essentially coming back to the fact that can the United States come and defend in case there is any escalation. Uh, Gauri, one Please get a comment from Admiral Sunil Lomba towards the end. Yes, sir. Hey, um... Currently, the United States is working to try to address some of those issues. I mean, it recognizes that, um, especially in short notice types of events, um, that is a significant disadvantage or an increasingly dis disadvantageous position uh, in the South China Sea. Um, one of the hopes is that the regional force posture um, and regular um, and routine presence um, through the South China Sea, in addition to acting with allies and partners, will serve as a deterrent um, to China in, in many circumstances. Um, clearly, this is not going to deter all Chinese behavior in the South China Sea, and we are still grappling with the issue of how to deal with China's gray zone challenges. Um, however, um, with more uh, forward-leaning statements um, by the State Department, and um, continued efforts for the United States to be able to develop capabilities that can rapidly be brought to bear um, in the region, I think that there are going to be an expanding number of possibilities for the United States over the next several years. Um, I, I will um, push back a little bit on the war game, and I, know, and I know those discussions, and I've actually been on the red teams in most of those war games. Um, one of the things we have to remember in those war games is that they are essentially um, uh, number crunching endeavors, okay? Um, one of the things that does not get measured is um, Chinese training and capabilities and experience. Um, two things that I think um, the United States in particular, but many of our allies and partners um, bring a great deal more to the table than what you see with the Chinese military. In addition, when we get into those Taiwan war games, um, everything tends to stop at a certain point relatively early in the game. Um, so I, I, I would be cautious in, treat, in, in, in treating those as a statement that in a conflict with China, uh, the United States could not win. Um, it's just the way that those war games are structured. Um, so, I'd, so I just want to caution against that um, in that there are still significant U.S. advantages um, when confronting uh, China's military. Hopefully that answered the question. All right, on that note, let me just uh, now welcome uh, His Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Philippines, uh, Mr. Ramon Bhagat Singh Jr. to also uh, briefly state uh, his country's uh, view in the backdrop of the changing dynamics. It started at some level with Manila officially going to the tribunal, but since then, sir, there's been back and forth politically at Manila's level as well, and a clawing back, so to say, from the United States. And amidst that back and forth, uh, the escalation has only continued. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much for this. I, I hope I can be heard. Uh, just to reiterate what our president said, the September 22 uh, statement to the United Nations, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he strongly described the 2016 ruling, the ruling of the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, in The Hague, that struck down the China's expansive claims in the disputed water as beyond compromise. The ruling is beyond compromise. It is beyond the reach of passing governments to dilute, diminish, or abandon. So we are strongly invoking the decision of the PCA 
and uh, and uh, and then we would like to work within the ambit of ASEAN solidarity. And this opens a uh, wider discussion on the South China Sea with the other major stakeholders. Uh, as I said, Vietnam, Brunei, uh, Indonesia, they are our neighbors, they are strong allies, and they would be part of the discussions on this. And uh, the Philippines, through the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, is the chairman on the discussions to come up with the code of conduct for the South China Sea. Hopefully, this will be resolved uh, in the ASEAN meeting before the end of the year, and uh, maybe uh, diffuse some of the tensions we have uh, with China. Uh, uh, my colleague, Ambassador Sanchao, mentioned about uh, trust. So this is something very important. We definitely have the trust in ASEAN solidarity. Now, how much trust do we have with China? How much trust, as uh, Dr. Kozat said, uh, will you, uh, the U.S., how, how strong will they push the envelope? In, uh, in committing to the regional and country alliances that they have. That is a question. But as far as UNCLOS uh, is concerned, you've had your experience between India and Bangladesh. We had a ruling, and this was implemented. So when the number of states uh, have come out supporting the Philippines and UNCLOS ruling in favor of the Philippines, we hope, as what uh, Ambassador Sanchao said, that uh, more countries will uh, support this and come up with a unity among nations of uh, uh, agreeing and asking that the decisions of Congress be respected. And we hope India will be part of that. And thank you very much for organizing this uh, this uh, webinar, the USI and RAND Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. I want to quickly now uh, get in. Uh, former Chief of uh, Naval Staff, uh, Admiral Sunil Lamba as well, sir, for your uh, quick comments on how do you see the region uh, and, and the entire Indo-Pacific region in your assessment, sir? Uh, thank you for giving me the question. Um, uh, whether the Quad can operate together at sea. Uh, for a number of years, uh, Malabar has been taking place where the three, Japan, United States, and India, have been exercising together. So we've been exercising bilaterally with Australia for the last couple of years. And there is no problem for all the four navies to operate together. Uh, as far as the Indian Navy is concerned, they have already given a go ahead to include Australia in the Malabar series of exercise. There is a call which needs to be taken. Uh, with signing of Comcasa, I think more and more communication kits and data transfer units will come in, so it will be much more easier for the four navies to operate together. Uh, tomorrow's, uh, Admiral Sina has said about tomorrow's meeting of the foreign ministers of the Quad members. In my opinion, I don't think so. It's too premature at the moment that there would be a military or a security element to quad at the moment. The uh, economic linkages which are there of all the members of the quad, I think will override security arrangements. And I agree with what General Sharma said, that we are the only member of the quad which has a disputed land boundary with China and the, the differential in national power between the two countries is only widening and that India needs to be cognizant about. Or, and I think that will be one major point which will be kept in mind by India when they look at a security a military element to quad. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, to all the members of uh, the audience who joined us, the, all the attendees and panelists, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ramon Bhagat Singh Jr., as well as uh, His Excellency, Mr. Chow, for joining us. Uh, as, as ladies and gentlemen, we talk about the paradigm shift that is taking place in South China Sea, I just want to say one thing, that all will flows from political will. At some level, the changes that are set to happen in America are going to have a huge impact in this entire region. And irrespective of the bipartisan agreement that may, take, that may be there uh, on the U.S. policy towards South China Sea, 
it is going to have a bearing as far as how the capabilities may shape up, the political narrative may change, and whether or not there will be some change as far as posturing is concerned. And I think that could be extremely significant for all stakeholders, as well as for uh, countries like India, Australia, part of the Quad arrangement. At the end of the day, we are all in democratic countries, and that will have a huge bearing on the arrangement of Quad as well. Thank you so much to all of you for this exhaustive discussion on the South China Sea, Chinese policy and its implications, and whether we are headed towards a more prosperous South China Sea or whether we are headed towards possibility of greater escalations. Good job, Gauri. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.